Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Voices in My Head, episode 29. We've been going around for a couple of years now, and this has been a really fun time. And today we have Patrick Lawler. What? We have a lawyer? What we got a lawyer for? I thought we only uh, interviewed narrators. No, he's not a lawyer. Well, he might be a lawyer, I don't know, but he's not a lawyer. He's Patrick Lawler. Lawler, Lawler. Oh, like Lawler, 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 Lawler. Like that? Uh, you're weird. Let's move on with the show. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are with Patrick Lawler. Uh, coming all the way from the Midwest, from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. All right. So, uh, Patrick, welcome to the show. Welcome aboard here. We got to meet and hang out a little bit back at, at uh, APAC this year, and uh, that, was, that was a good time. So, uh, Pat, Patrick, has, he's got over 300 audiobooks out there. Been doing this since when? When did you start with audiobooks? I did my first one in 2001. Wow. So, yeah, so it's, 15, been, it's been a few years, years at it and, and going strong. Uh, Pat's, Patrick's got a, uh, an MFA from, in classical acting, primarily Shakespeare, and uh, works stage and uh, audio books, um, has been an actor, director, stuntman, fight choreographer, teacher, tour guide, dancer, pub singer, bad mime, and yes, waiter, bartender, and lots of file clerk gigs, according to his bio. Now, I almost said pole dancer, which... Well, not, I, yeah, that, that's a little above my pay grade. <laughs> So, I'm not well, quite that yeah. gifted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't do the thing gripping the pole with your butt cheeks and climbing it with your. Well, I didn't feet. say I couldn't. I, 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 I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm not as talented as some, you know, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's a very particular clientele that would, that would get into that. Yeah, me. yeah, I can agree with that. I never was able to get tips doing that myself. So I, I got some tips and the tips were like, you know, get out of here. So, yeah. so what got you into, t tell us about what got you into audiobooks to begin with. What, what well, brought you into this business? Well, I was a uh, classical stage actor in Los Angeles in the uh, uh, 80s, 90s, probably 90s, we'll say. And there wasn't a whole lot of it wasn't a whole lot of classical stage work, and so I was I was working as a uh, file clerk and uh, worked my way up to middle manage middle management in um, studio legal departments, doing uh, a lot of filing and things like that. Very exciting stuff like oh, that. Yeah. And for Valentine's Day, my wife got me a uh, session with the Learning Annex, mm -hmm. and uh, she she always kind of liked my voice, so she she got me a uh, Valentine's Day gift which was a session with the a general voiceover overview class with the mm. Learning Annex, which had, uh, it had straight commercials, animation, which is a blast, uh, pretty much everything except audiobooks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and while I was taking classes, somebody said, hey, there's this thing in New York uh, where you go and you audition for every major publisher out there and then you have uh, you have some time to get FaceTime with them. So I went and did that in 2001, and it took. And I did, like, I think I did three the first year, maybe five the second year, and then it kind of took off after that. And I've been mm. doing pretty much working steadily ever since. So. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. Did you ever, were you a fan of audiobooks before you got into it? Honestly, when um, when I was taking the voiceover class and somebody mentioned audiobooks, I, I kind of said, "Oh, that's a thing," you know. So I hadn't really, I, I really kind of didn't consider it. I didn't, I didn't really realize at that point what it was. And then I started listening to to some of the people that were out there doing it, um, and I became a fan rather quickly. Wow! Wow! Well, that's pretty cool. So, did you get, did you do commercial voiceover? No, actually, I started to, but the audiobooks was the first thing that clicked, and mm. I just, you know, got so busy that I just never pursued anything else. 
There you go. Well, it seems like there's there's a pretty big divide out there, and I've had, talked to other folks that I've interviewed on the show between doing commercial voiceover or audio books. It's kind of like the difference between a sprinter and a marathon runner. The, yeah. the twain don't really mix. Yeah, kind of. I, I think we'd kick their ass in a softball game. But, uh, oh, yeah. But, yeah, um, it, it, it is a different art form, and some people are very good at, uh, at both. Mm. And I know a lot of people, a lot of the audiobook guys uh, – crossover and are able to, to do both uh some very successfully um a lot more do animation i think and mm. things like that because it's character driven and stuff right like that. commercial is kind of its own set of its own set of rules uh but yeah it seems to fall down that way it seems to like you seem to get a lot of work doing audiobooks you don't get a lot of work doing commercials and with those rare exceptions yeah i i I guess it's I guess it's endurance. And I'll go with that because that sounds there you go. There you you go. know, makes me sound <laughs> tough. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you always lived in Milwaukee? No, actually, I uh, when I started audiobooks, we lived in Los Angeles at the mm. time. Um, I went to grad school here back in the '80s for mm. theater, and after that, kind of roamed around, uh, worked in uh, New York in theater for a few years, and I was on a tour that took me to the West coast and a buddy of mine was doing a stunt show at magic mountain that paid twice as much as what I was making on the tour. Mm. And he asked me if I could, you know, jump ship and do that and, uh, moved out there, did the stunt show. It was wrapping up. And about the time I was getting ready to go back to New York, I met my wife and stayed in LA for 10 more years. Oh, wow. Yeah. It just, it just kind of worked out that way. It happens that way. Yeah, it does. Uh, and then, um, then when that whole housing market nonsense and around uh, 2004, when that all kind of happened, we were looking to buy a place and there wasn't really anything that we could have in our price range. So we kind of just, I've always liked Milwaukee from grad school days mm. and it was a step above throwing a dart at a map. So we packed, we packed up the dogs and moved back. Very so, nice. Very nice. And, Never turned back, I assume. Not at all. Thought about it every winter, but, uh, well, who am I complaining to? You're in Alaska. <laughs> this is, yes, yes, I am uh, indeed. But then uh, again, person. I've, <laughs> I've got relatives. i got an aunt and a and cousin that live in uh, Wisconsin. I, I'm not sure exactly where. It's out in the hills somewhere. But uh, they, uh, uh, they're both from here as well. And uh, they say, yeah, sometimes the winters down there are a lot harsher than they are here. Oh, is that right? So it just, just depends, you know. So we got guys... that going for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in, in the titles that you do and in the work that you do, what, uh, what draws you to a particular title? Well, the fact that someone offers it to me is the first biggest draw. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really enjoy, uh, I really enjoy the action adventures and the, uh, and the, the um, kind of the cop dramas and things like that, you know, things with mm. things with colorful characters that mm -hmm. I can kind of go a little nuts on, and uh, and a lot of real real good meaty action sequences. I, I seem to I seem to be drawn to those. Um, lately, lately also though, I've been I've been kind of getting into nonfiction. I've been getting some interesting. Mm interesting nonfictions with all the all the madness and things that are going on down here in the lower 48 mm -hmm. you know it's uh, you know there we've been i've been getting some great titles people have been putting out some nice. very interesting books on subjects that are um that are are becoming hot button issues like uh, um in fact right now i'm doing one on what's called covering which is what minorities and uh what we would call maybe oppressed groups uh, do to fit in, basically. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm finding all of this fascinating reading, and I'm learning, I'm learning a lot of different things from a lot of different points of view on mm. subjects that I see in the news and kind of go, okay, well, that's, let's, see what, let's see what, and from both sides of the aisle, you know, from, from, both, from a lot of different viewpoints. Right, which, right. Which is, I, I'm loving it because it's very... I think it's mentally very healthy, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to 
to be able to bounce back and forth. You know, it's like it might not be my viewpoint, but they have valid. They have right. valid. It can kind of help you say, oh yeah, okay. Now it makes sense why they think what they think. Exactly. I still think they're wrong, but. Oh yeah, yeah, but or, but, but at least now I think of them as a person rather than you know. There you go. Characters. Now, has have you done any nonfiction type books that changed your perspective on something? Um, actually, yeah, I did. I did. Um, I did one called America's Original Sin, which is as a you know as as a kind of middle class middle aged white dude who's you know doing okay um i have never thought that i was part of like the racism problem you know mm -hmm. i never i never thought you know i i i have a lot of friends of various of various um ethnicities and uh, i have a lot of friends of all kinds of different uh, beliefs and persuasions and things and i I just never considered the fact that, you know, part of the part of the problem for me is um, is that things that have been given to me that haven't been given to these other other groups plays into the problem, and and not acknowledging that I have this leg up to start with is is kind of part of the problem, and it's the old it's the old adage. It's like, how do you spot the racist? He's the one that says, I'm not a racist, but Mm. you know, in the party. And so it, this book was laid out and it, it, it laid out a lot of things from, um, and actually it was written by a, a middle-aged white guy, uh, but one that has been instrumental in civil rights since, uh, you know, since the early days, you mm. know, with Martin Luther King and things. And it just, it really did actually make me stop and think and, mm and really consider my own actions, you know, that I thought were benign and I thought were actually probably pretty positive, but there's just a lot of, just a lot of denial. And it was, it was really interesting to have my eyes opened by, by reading that. Interesting. interesting. So Very interesting. That, that was one of them. <laughs> so yeah, and, you, you've oh, go got ahead. a good hand in both in fiction and in nonfiction, what kind of, and you were saying you prefer like the, the action titles for, for fiction stuff. Oh yeah. I love, I love, I love those. I like, I like kids books cause you can mm. do the funny voices and you can kind of get away with a, with a lot. You still have to have, in, you know, the same integrity, but you can get away with a lot more silliness. And mm. I, I really like that kind of stuff. And, uh, and romances actually. I love, I love doing romances really? cause yeah, they're very, they're very pure storytelling, you know, mm -hmm. and very, you know, the, you've got, you've got a hero, you've got a heroine, or you've got two heroes, or you've got two heroines, whatever. But there's always a happy ending. And uh, there's always, there's always a journey that they take from, you know, imperfection and some flaw that keeps them from getting together to their happy ending. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a really, really uplifting genre. And, and, I like working in that. And my favorite, I've got one author, um, Suzanne Brockman, mm. who combines, she combines the two. She does technically their romances because they follow that pattern, but they're also adventure, action adventures and mm. her main characters are Navy SEALs. So, mm. and they're not, you know, it's like, hi, I'm a Navy SEAL and now we spend the weekend on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, they're like Navy, Navy SEALs who are like deep in the shit and, um, Got oh, wait, it. Got is this it. for a? Are, are you gonna be bleeping me out and stuff like that? Oh no, no, no! This is a PG thirteen. Okay, excellent. But yeah, they're 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 Navy SEALs and private contractors and things that that actually are involved in like these intricate, dangerous mm. plots and things like that. And then the romance is kind of happening, sort of when it can. And the you know usually the woman gets sucked into it too, and they um, right right they end That's... up having a thing. So yeah. So when you, in this particular one or in others that you may have done, I, I know I've found, I've done a couple similar to that, but I've found that a lot of times it's, how do I say it? It's chick lit with a couple of studs in it. And yeah. even the action sequence is somehow or another the character's thinking about her fashion sense. You know, <laughs> what, what outfit she wore to combat. I'm like, what? But, well, as a, but they sell well, you know, and... Sure. Someone likes them out there. Yeah. And so 
do you ever run into something like that where, where you oh, as yeah. a male narrator are thinking, what the heck? Oh, all the time. All the time. And, uh, yeah, it's usually it's like boy meets girl. Boy and girl spend, you know, seven and a half hours talking about their feelings and then girl gets boy. So uh-huh. that's kind of the, the, the sort of thing. But, but no, this, the ones that I was just talking about are better because, excuse me, they actually make fun of that. A little bit. They actually kind of poke a little fun at it. Like someone will like start talking about their deep feelings and their buddy will be like, what are you doing? You know, what are you, what are you talking about? We're being shot at, you know, or, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be, it, it's handled really well. Or there'll be the, the big moment where the guy drops his pants and he's ready to come to the woman and he'll forget that they're still around his ankles and he'll trip and hit his head on the, uh, on the, <laughs> That's my kind of romance. <laughs> yeah, well, it's great. It's it's very, it's very uh, real, and 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 the characters are are very much people, and they're very much flawed people, and and uh, yeah, and she she does she makes a make, pokes a lot of fun at the genre while being in the genre. So it's it's really just brilliant writing, and she is she's probably by far and away my favorite. So oh, that's oh, excellent. that's excellent. Yeah, excuse excellent. me. A second. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. I'm back. You betcha. You yeah. betcha. It's always good to get the phlegm out. That's that's right. Yeah, I was actually recording something the other night, and I had a string of sneezes that hit. Oh, jeez. You know, I'm like halfway through a word, and I can feel that tickle starting to come up in the back. And then yeah. all of a sudden, it's like 10 sneezes in a row. It just wouldn't stop. I don't know what had got in my booth or up my nose or whatever it was, but oh. So painful. And I wasn't sure that my voice even sounded the same for the rest of that paragraph because it was like, ah, man, it just threw me off. And you just want to get that paragraph done. You want to make sure you get through it because you don't want to stop and have to go back. And and you get that like little rat tail on the waveforms where it just keeps getting (laughs) smaller and smaller. And then at the end, it's like, (laughs) and you get the big thing across. Yeah, I know that feeling. It's like, I know it's coming. And I've got, and dang it, I'm going to make it through this, and I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I get to the end of this sentence anyway. And then you, then uh, yeah, I'll get to the last word, and I will be able to get it out. Yeah, so that's terrible. That's one of those kind of things where you see something's coming on, and yep, you know, yeah, it's like all right. Now, how uh, how many hours a day do you? How many finished hours a day do you typically get? I generally. If I'm cranking on all cylinders and everything's going well, I, I try to I try to keep it at about two and a half to three. I, I like to keep it kind of kind of in that range. Three is pretty much a good day mm-hmm. here, and um, and you know it gives me a chance to get out and do some other stuff. And uh, and and if I mean there are the exceptions, you know, mm-hmm. if you're if you've got a deadline tomorrow and you've got you know five hours left and you're gonna Try to crank that out. Just gotta get it. But out. yeah, but right now I'm doing like I I just opened uh, this past weekend. I just opened a play, so mm-hmm. basically evenings, you know, for most of the week, and then the weekends are are taken up. So I can maybe get, I mean, I can maybe work for about four or five hours. And, mm-hmm. and so if I'm having a good day, that'll that'll put it at about two and a half. And that's my next question. Do you have a, a job that you do outside? And it sounds like theater is part uh, of that job. Yeah, generally, generally no. Generally, I do this, but I, I like to try to get out and do a play when I can, mm. and uh, and uh, you know keep my foot in in that. I I don't like turning down work, and mm-hmm. when I'm when I'm getting when I'm getting books coming in, the you know it's just it's very hard to say no to it. So I don't oh, do right. a lot of plays, but. You know, this being an election year and everything, Julius Caesar just looked good. So we're we're doing that outdoors on the side of a hill. So, oh, nice. Yeah, overlooking an English pub. So Saturday nights, it's we have some competition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun, though. A lot it of fun. Is. It's a blast. Now, I see some musical instruments behind you there. Your guitar and you got a baron back there. I do. I've got a mandolin and... I basically put those up just kind of as as background for you, so that oh okay, <laughs> so I looked like I was you know talented. You're, you're but, the uh, Renaissance man. Exactly. Now I play Balron a little bit. I've played for a few years. Um, 
mostly, you know, Irish folk festivals and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And uh, actually, I haven't played for, for a few months, so God only knows what would happen if <laughs> if I did. But uh, hey, guitar and guitar and mandolin I strum at and, and just enjoy. Nice. It's something um, I took them up because when I, when I was in grad school for theater, my theory was that I should have an alternate art, art form that I'm allowed to suck at. So mm-hmm. that I could like really concentrate on the one art form, and so uh, so while I was all serious and grad studenty about the uh, about theater, um, I was able to just pull the guitar out and just bang away at it. And that's a, do that's a, lot a good of, way to do it. Do a lot of Irish folk music, and uh, which is really not taxing. You know, it's mm-hmm. pretty it's pretty easy to learn. And uh, right, right, and right, right. So. right. Yeah, I used to play Bowron myself as well, as well as other all kinds oh, yeah? of other percussion, and uh, never could get my fingers to my arthritic hands. Won't do uh, guitars and pianos and all that stuff, but I could sure. I could grab a tipper and tip away. Oh yeah, and, I, sometimes I find myself just picking up like a like a, a book or something and a pencil and just yep. you know popping it out, and it's just it's just something about that motion just makes you happy. You know? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, know. and making noise, oh, you know. Yeah. All kinds. Of, get that noise and make some nice little notes out of it, and then you can start dancing a jig, and people will think, "Ah, oh, he's been drinking any." So. <laughs> That's right. It's a good excuse. I buy I, I buy the Guinness so that I can just pour it on the bar on to uh, oh to, yeah uh, wet the to wet the skin so that <laughs> it's it's conditioning. It's for my instrument. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so do you um ah uh, shoot question was up there and then it kind of floated away. <laughs> Oh, do you primarily do all your recording out of your home studio, or do you also work in studio? At other I do. Locations? Well, I do most of it here. Um, I do a, a good deal. I go over. I'm just right across the water from Brilliance Audio mm. in uh, Grand Haven, Michigan, mm-hmm. and it's about. If I take the boat, it's about a two and a half hour ride, mm. and if I drive around the bottom of Lake Michigan, it's a, maybe a five hour drive. Mm. So I go over there quite a bit. They were, they were one of the first companies to hire me, and I've been working pretty much with them since 2001. So oh, nice. nice. Yeah. So it, and it just works out that you know they're they're very close. But I'm also talking with a couple of studios in LA and New York to try to facilitate getting out there because I really really prefer working in studio. You know, mm. And that was going to be my next question: Do you prefer doing that versus being at home? Absolutely, absolutely. It's what it's do just you not, prefer about it. Well, it's it, for first and foremost, it's really just nice to have people around. You know, mm-hmm. other people just to to, to talk to. Uh, but uh, also, it's it's so much easier for me because I'm not an engineer. Um, mm-hmm. I know the amount of engineering that I have to know to to do what I have to do, and I can. I mean, I can completely process an audiobook and get it out, but um, it's not my it's not my expertise. So my expertise is the the performing of the piece. So mm-hmm. if I can do that and have somebody somebody running the machinery and somebody else watching over me to make sure that I get all the words right and uh, I'm having a little integrity, that's it's it's a great plus. You know, it helps quite a bit, and that actually makes the product better. And un- sadly. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love recording at home, and I love the fact that it's opened up the industry to so many people to do so much. But sadly, I think it takes a little bit away from the integrity of the piece when it's one when it's one person mm. kind of overseeing all of it. You know, when when there's other ears listening, it's all, I think it's always a better product. It's mm-hmm. always it's always just better when it's collaborative. Um, but that said, yeah, about ninety percent of my work is at home by myself. You know, being the one listening right, to right. it. So, right. But it's uh, it is a different experience. It's a totally different experience, and I can I can go a lot faster too if I've got an engineer. You know, mm-hmm. I can because I'm not afraid of making mistakes. Uh, I'm not listening for mistakes. Right. I'm not. I don't have my director's hat on when I'm doing that. So I can. I can go a lot faster, and they can be queuing up while I'm finding my place on the page. So the whole process just goes by a lot, a lot smoother. 
Interesting. 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 So what what did you think when you got your first gig? What did it feel like to you to to get selected to do your first title? It was pretty exciting. Um, I went to this thing. They had um, they had a uh, they called it a job market in um, New York. This is back in 2000, 2001, I guess it was. And, um, and what it was basically is your morning was a five-minute audition in front of, at that point, every audio publisher around. Mm. Then, then you had a, oh, you had a, you'd had a dinner and a cocktail party the night before with them. Then that, then lunch with them where they randomly sat you. Mm. And then an afternoon of speed dating where you just, you know, you have all the tables all over the room and the publishers sit at them and you get five minutes to go around and talk to everybody, mm. which, was, which was brilliant. But I did this. I went and um, I did my two piece. I did two short pieces for my five minutes. And on the way to lunch, a uh, guy, uh, John McElroy, who's, who's uh, still publishes, he's still very big in the business, right. uh, came up to me and said, I think I have something for you. Mm. And so it was pretty much right off the bat, I got something. I was wow. like, very excited. And he he brought it to me, like, after the, the cocktail party. And it was like, it was like a letter to Penthouse. You know, it was, it was, <laughs> and I was, I was thinking, wow, what, what did he, what did he get from <laughs> my reading that said, this is, this guy's going to be right for this. But it was, it was actually like a half hour, it was a short thing. It required me to actually extend my trip to New York by a couple of days. So it was basically a wash. I got paid about what I spent to, to extend my trip. But, um, but it felt great. I mean, it was like, oh, my God, I got, I got a gig right away. And I went and did it, and it was a, an, amazing, an amazing experience. Um, uh, first of all, I went, I went to the wrong place. Oh. Yeah, first I read the I read the stuff and like I said it's like a letter to Penthouse or something, and then I went down to uh, downtown New York, and uh, downtown Manhattan and and got the address. I transposed a couple of letters or numbers in the address and went to what turned out to be like a Russian travel agency, oh. and <laughs> so there were all these like Russian you know very surly guys with cigarettes hanging out of their mouths. Yes, what do you want? You know, and I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> oh, you here to read porn? This yes, is we have porn are, reading back. You are actor. Okay, good. Come back with me. Um, <laughs> but no, it was. Uh, I felt like that girl in uh, Fame who goes off to do her big video thing, and yeah. But uh, <laughs> it turned out to be a misunderstanding. I went down, called them, and they said, "Oh, we're right across the street." I went. Um, McElroy was, he's a fantastic director. He's really, really great. Got me all ready, got me all set, put me in the booth. I'm in there getting ready to start. And in walk like five people into the, uh, the little waiting area. And they're all the, 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 the print publishers and they wanted to all hear it. And so there's like men and women. And this is very, very stupid. Well, no, I don't want to say stupid. It was very interesting material. And, I'm reading it, and there's a like a, there's a window like off here on the side, and I, I'm just sitting there kind of reading, and I can see them out this little porthole, and they are literally rolling around on the floor laughing, at as I'm trying to keep a straight face doing doing this this just porn. And it's just I mean it's 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 high class porn. It's like you know a, a guy's like going to buy a new house, and he has a camera, and there's a woman there, and they go through and little articles of clothing get dropped and yeah, and all this kind of, you know, you know the thing. I'm oh, sure yeah. you know the thing. Yeah. You, you live in the last music house. in the background while you're reading. Yeah. You got a baseline going and you know, it's, but it's, um, yeah. And, and so I'm reading this and, and they're just dying laughing and I'm holding it in cause I don't know, you know, it's my first one. I don't know. My stomach is growling. So I've got a pillow like over my stomach keeping me from, uh, you know, keeping me from growling into the microphone. So it's very, like, unerotic, you know, and and, uh, and I'm holding it together because this is my debut and, and I don't want to, like, look like I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm I'm reading it and I'm, I'm, I'm just intense and everything's going good until I get to this line. And the line was, to keep you from spit-taking, I'll just wait a second, but the line was... <laughs> 
And he was talking about his, his affair, and he says, until, alas, it began to dance the jerky dance of intimate climax. And it's like, whoa. And I lost it. I just, I just lost it. I just, I could no longer hold it in, and I just, I just, I just fell about the place. And it, it took about 10 minutes for us all to get back to the last four paragraphs of the book. But, uh, oh, but that was my first one. So, yes, it felt... It felt great to have. It, it felt great to have it. And when it came out, it was. It actually sounded really good. So uh, <laughs> it was. You know, I was. I was. List, I actually put it in. Put it in while I was driving. You know, to my my file job in in L.A. And uh, I was listening to it and going, "Wow, I'm kind of like aroused by that voice. That's really nice." So did you, you play know, it back for your wife? Oh yeah. Oh, we still we play it to this day. Yeah. <laughs> It's the mood setter. Yes, we have to. We we pull it out every now and again. That's uh, yeah. That's that's. But, but we're not going to get into that here. So no, no, no. But okay, good, good, good. What happens at home stays at home. That's right. So, and that, so yeah. So anyway, that was my that was my first one, and then um, yeah, talk about a baptism by fire. Oh, holy, holy moly! And, and with then, people watching, that would be the hardest thing for me. I've only done a couple of erotica type, you know, sex scene books. <laughs> I could not imagine doing I mean, I'm paranoid because my sons are 10 feet away in their bedroom. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. My wife's my wife's office is right below us here, right below me here. So when I'm doing that here and she hears me, you know, get the juices flowing, it's, you know, <laughs> I imagine it's very hard to work. But uh, <laughs> but it's yeah, it, it, it is weird to have an audience. It really is because. Wow. You know, it's, it's, that's why I got into this business is it's, you know, so I can do porn into my uh, 40 pluses, you know, so. That's but, it. That's it. No one will know. You just got to have that sexy voice. That's right. That's right. So, you just have to whisper. There you go. <laughs> that's all it is. Just, just cuddle up close to that microphone and put a little <laughs> smile on your face. <laughs> and it'll put now, a little smile on your face. Have you, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you have, um, but I may be wrong. Have you ever done a book that absolutely sucked? Not your read of it, but the material. Oh, all the time. It's my specialty. No. <laughs> um, How? That's, what? That's what advice do you give? Because you know, if you talk to some new narrators, they're like, "Oh man, this is garbage. I can't believe I signed up to do this." Yeah. That's How do you point. muscle through that? Well, first of all, you're getting paid, or hopefully, you're getting paid. Um, but you got to look at it from the author's point of view because you, you're the author's representative here. You're not, it's not about you. It's not, it's not about me. It's about the author. It's about getting the author's work out. This book was important enough to somebody to write. So it's not up to you to judge the book. It's up mm. to you to do the book as well as you can do it. I mean, there are, and, and that said, I, have, I launch into some, some pretty saucy language when I get to you know, sections that are just, you know, completely nonsensical, you know, or, or they're just, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. there's no, um, there's no thought whatsoever for punctuation or, or it may be the fifth time the author has said something or, yeah, they're in or the re redundantly redundant saying it over and over again, multiple times mode. Yeah. Or to, to quote Scott Brick, a parenthetical bridge too far. <laughs> You know, where it's just like subclauses within subclauses within parentheses within dashes. And it's just some people get a little carried away with it. And yep. just to, to, to connect point A to point B is just really difficult sometimes. But I, I mean, that's part of the game. I mean, I think a lot of the books that are out there now, I think like any other industry, the publishing industry does cut back. And I think there's not as much editing and not as much nurturing by the editor that mm -hmm. goes on. And, uh, and a lot of these people are not necessarily, especially with nonfiction, mm -hmm. a lot of these people are not writers. They're right. people who have a very interesting story to tell and they're doing the best they can to tell it. So I, I, if I look at it that way, it makes it a lot easier and it makes it, it makes it a lot more enjoyable and, you know, I think it, I think it makes the product better in the end, which is kind of what we all want. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. They're, they're writing from the bottom of their heart, whatever wherever yeah. their skill level is at. And sure. 
you know, the funny thing is that I've, re I've read some books that I've narrated that have, I was like, oh, man, I can't <laughs> believe I agreed to do this. And then the thing turns around and sells thousands and thousands of copies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, who I, the heck? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll run with this. This is cool. Yeah, I mean, I have one that, yeah, that just, I just did the, uh, I just did the, uh, the 10th anniversary edition of it. It was a book that they gave me kind of to, to fill in some time that I had, you know, in between books. And nobody expected it to do very well, and it took off. I did one, um, this little book that nobody ever, just nobody expected it to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called Three Cups of Tea, mm -hmm. which was by a guy named Greg Mortensen. And it took off. It, it, it became like this huge huge book for a while and then it was i guess found out that he may have fabricated some some portions of it and uh and there was a big scandal with that but at one point it was the largest it was the the widest selling was that the one that was on oprah yeah, uh no 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 that was okay. another one. this was the one that the guy john krakauer who wrote into thin air and um uh what is the other one the uh the guy that went up to alaska and died in a bus. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote that, too. I'm, I'm familiar uh, with that story. Yeah, yeah and but it's, um, it actually uh, it is a story about a guy who basically got lost on a mountain climbing expedition and wandered into a village and saw that they needed, and they, they basically nursed him to health, and he saw that the girls needed a school, and he came back and built them a school, and then he dedicated his life to building schools in the um, in, in the uh, areas of Pakistan and Tibet and uh, those areas where, um, you know, where it was definitely needed and where it was a lot of times in direct competition with madrasas and things run by the Taliban. Mm -hmm. He was for a while just touted as the only person really making a difference in the war on terror, mm -hmm. you know, because he was actually teaching and and. And he may have, I mean, in my opinion, and, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know all the facts, and he may have fabricated some stuff, and, and you know, authors do. You know, it happens. But the bottom line is he actually did construct hundreds of schools and, and gave thousands of people a chance at education that they wouldn't have had normally. Right. He, did, he did good work. And at the time that I met him, he was – living in his mom's basement and mm. um, and I think at the time of his his biggest success he was still living very modestly and any money that he was making was going back into the into the thing so mm. but anyway yeah that was a book that nobody thought was going to do anything and it uh it took off and it was a oh, huge yeah. huge seller so to make a short story long that's uh <laughs> you know <laughs> wow that was wow. one of those situations it's rare. It's more rare, actually. You were talking about getting books that suck. It's more rare to get books that are really, really well written. Yeah. You know, yeah. like 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 excellently written. And it's and it's not any it's not any reflection on authors or anything like that. It's just sheer volume. It's yeah. just the yeah. number of books that are out there. You know, the chances of there being really good ones is you know. And then there's and nowadays there are hundreds of us doing this. Um, mm -hmm narrating so those those few good books that happen get distributed amongst us and, uh, right right and, and after become, simon vance takes his and you know yeah, the rest yeah of us simon are, takes his scott takes his and sean pratt <laughs> takes the rest and then kafer gets all the other all the good porn well, yeah well kafer gets the good well kafer's got a deal with the devil so you know <laughs> he sold his soul at the crossroads he sold his soul to mickey mouse you know <laughs> Those, those of you who follow him on Facebook will understand. Oh yes, <laughs> yes indeed. Now no, no, those guys, those guys get the good books for for a reason. You know, I'm not. I joke, but I joke. But there are really like some. There are some superstars who should get the good books. So. Oh yeah, and and that's that's a thing too. For new narrators that want to get into this, because as you know, there's a lot of folks that want to get into what we do. Sure. And I mean, we just constantly inundated with new talent coming in and they kind of evaporate quickly for a lot. Mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to a new narrator coming in who, you know, to, to give them some, either some stick to it 
or to to you know realize early this may not be your gig well listen to yourself as the first thing and be critical i mean do you want to sit locked in a car for eight hours listening to you you know mm -hmm. and 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 if the answer is no then yeah it's not it's not your gig um if you find it i mean i personally find listening to myself to be uh difficult mm -hmm. yeah I, I just don't i don't care for it but i still do it because it's very important to 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 know what you're doing and to uh, to to hear how you're coming across um if you like your voice and if you you can listen to yourself and others also can listen to you that's a very big distinction uh, then the next step is staying with it because there is no guarantee of work no matter how many books you do um no guarantee of paying work if you've done you know if you say you start with acx which is a great place to start i think for mm -hmm. for narrators uh, there's no guarantee that if you do a, a royalty share, it's going to make any money. Right, uh, right. There's no, if you get a stipend, uh, there's no guarantee that that's going to lead to other work. You know, none of it, none of it's guaranteed. So it, it's always, you always have to stick to it. You always have to keep refining what you do. I still, after, what is this now, 15 years of doing this, I'm still trying to figure out how to do it. You mm -hmm. know, there are, there are things that, uh, that I know I don't do well that I have to come back, I have to come back to constantly. I keep a, uh, I keep a log of difficult words and phrases, mm. like with every book. You know, it's like I started out by making fun of them, but then I thought, you know, they, they keep recurring. Right. You know, things like um, words that end in D followed by words that start in D and things like that. And, uh, you know, just weird phraseologies and things. Uh, you have to keep, you have to keep, improving yourself to stay competitive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and the publishers listen the 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 uh the other publishers um that i'll, I'll call them mainstream i guess to right to differentiate um they are inundated with thousands and thousands of voices every every year and they don't remember you know you have to keep in you know, they they know me and we have great working relationships and I have to keep on them. You know, I have to I have to check in every couple of weeks if I haven't heard from right, one of them. Right. Um, you know, it's not that they don't remember you necessarily. It's just you're not on the, the front of their mind and you need to be in the front of their mind when the books come in. Um, that said, they're also people and they don't like to be barraged by uh, by stuff mm -hmm. so if you don't have something good to say don't don't keep sending them email going hey you got any books hey you got any books you know they'll they'll basically just see your name and just hit delete so right. when you have something good going on like hey i just did this you know um yeah let them know or you know i'm gonna be in your area and uh just wondering if you have anything um this is, of course, once you've sent them the demo and once they've established contact back with you. Right, they know that. a little something about you, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's in, in audiobooks, more than anything else, it's really about relationships. Mm -hmm. It's really about person to person, and, um, you know, it's, it's, you really have to watch, you know, how you are around people, because right. if, you're, if you're a dick, that gets around. Oh, yeah. Know? That oh, gets yeah. around really quick, and you don't work. Oh, yeah. And I don't care how good you are. If people don't like working with you, this yeah. is... There, there's nothing quite like that expression that you can see on a producer's face at APAC when yes. someone's hounding them, over, and then they see them that night at the bar, and they're hounding them again, and you oh, just yeah. see the guy's yeah. eyes roll back in his head like, oh, God, get him away from me. <laughs> yeah, that's I, guess, I, I I do get pulled away like quite a bit by by producers like i'll be walking by the goal patrick i gotta talk to you and and <laughs> they never really have to talk to me so there's nothing so pressing at the naughty awards that can't wait till the next day so if if you're ever talking to a producer and they do that you know 
take it as a shield for take them. Take it as a hint. Yeah. We're, we're like their secret service. It is. Yeah. We're just you, if they know us and they they know that we can just walk them to the bar and not talk about work. Yeah, because they you, it's that's a big thing. I mean, the, these things, the APAC thing, which is an awesome, awesome event. Mm -hmm. uh, it really can be a very valuable tool, and you can also screw yourself by going to it um, and making a making an ass of yourself. I mean, right, these right. are it's a long day. These are these are people. You know, they're they're they've got their agendas too. You know, so so introduce yourself by all means. Mm -hmm. But you know, be be respectful of the fact that they then you know have have their seminars to get to and they oh, have their, oh. you know, they want to eat lunch and they want to have that beer and, you know, oh, they want to oh. discuss at that point, I guess it's hockey, you know, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is that isn't audio books at that moment, you know, they don't, right, right, they don't right. want to hear about your, your 15 um, titles that you wrote and did yourself and put on like a cassette tape that they can listen to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've had it early days, but yeah, it, it, it definitely, we, there was a few out there that did that kind of stuff. But, yeah, you yeah. know, that cassette tape, that reminds me, just last week I was cleaning out a, some old boxes here and I found a cassette tape of my first ever audio demo that I had made oh my God. back in the mid-90s. I was living on my grandparents' farm and I was a construction worker who desperately wanted to do something else. <laughs> and I got out my cassette player and I did a demo. I wanted to become a radio announcer of some sort. And I turned it in and I listened back to that thing. And I was like, oh, my goodness. How did anyone ever hire me? I ended up getting into commercial voiceover and, and talk radio after that. But I was like, oh, man, that would not fly today. No way. But, uh, just brought back that memory. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's I did... Um... I put together my first animation reel from a cassette tape onto, so I don't even know how I got it onto digital, and it was on, um, oh, geez, I don't even know what the what the, the system was. They don't make it anymore. Mm. But I somehow got it on there and cleaned it up and played with it, and, uh, and maybe that's why I don't do animation. <laughs> <laughs> it's the real reason. It's not that I haven't had time. It's just, you know, dude, it's you're too embarrassed not to go back there. Your, your demo sounds totally analog. It's like, yeah, well, okay, and scratchy at that. So I don't know. I, I guess I got I got to look at it again now that I have all this high tech equipment. So, but well, uh, well, that said, I do have one of the Leprechaun Brothers would like to come up and ask you a question, uh, and uh, if, if that's okay with you, always glad to. Always glad to help out the fellows. Oh, well, excellent. Bertold, Bertold, are you ready with your question? Yes, Mr. Basel, I'm here. Sorry. Oh, hi, Mr. Patrick Lawler. How are you doing today? Oh, just fine. How are you? I'm doing terrific. Uh, What's sorry. What's that? What's your name again? Bertold. Bert I'm Bertold the Beardless, or Bertold oh. No Beard. Or oh, just I'm so Bertold. sorry. <laughs> I'm but, so sorry to hear that. Well, that's okay. I don't have to shave. My three uh, brothers, on the other hand, Feely, Neely, and Buffin, they got hairy faces that you can't even tell that they're humans sometimes. <laughs> but all three of them and Gerald the Troll, our butler, went fishing, and I haven't heard anything from them except on the news this evening. I did hear that uh, there was an apparent accident where some person of large size swallowed several salmon that were on hooks from other people's fishing lures. Well, and uh, the only person I could think of doing that would be uh, Gerald the Troll. And uh, so we may be hearing some more in the news about that. I don't know. Uh, I, I hope he's not hooked. Well, I'm more afraid of the fisherman because he's uh -huh. a rather large guy who doesn't like pain in his mouth. So Ooh. we'll find out what happened to them. Large oh. reports of casualties, <laughs> just be advised. That's fingers right. crossed. Fingers crossed. So I have a question for you. You're your biology, your, your bi what do they call that? Biography. Your biography says that when you're trying to relax in your spare time, you run marathons. That's right. Is someone chasing you? 
<laughs> Why would you run like that? <laughs> they have beer at the end. Oh, well, then I get it now. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but that's like, what, 26 miles? It is. Absolutely. How many times have you done that? I have done overall 15, no, I'm sorry, 14 of them. I've done 12 since the uh, Reagan administration. So we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Whoa. So you've run over 300 miles. Oh, at least, yeah. Have you got to where you're going yet? No, I just keep going in circles. Well, that's easy. The earth is round. <laughs> there we are. There Have you are. ever tried to do a transatlantic one? I keep trying, but the waves keep shoving me back in. I that's can't. the same problem that my brother Boffin had. Is that right? He's only three feet tall, so, you know, it's oh. even harder. He makes okay. it like to the end of the beach, and then <laughs> bloop, that's the end of that. Oh, yeah. Well, that's how I learned to body surf. Oh. Like, I was nice. trying to run. I was actually doing a Trans-Pacific. I was trying to run to Hawaii, and uh, the Pacific Ocean just kept spitting me out. So uh, it just I kept getting to a certain point, and it would just go back. So what's the funnest place that you've done a marathon in? Oh, let me see. Probably the, the most fun I had was, uh, I think, through the streets of Chicago. I think it was the most fun. It was, uh, you got to go all over Chicago, got to see both baseball fields and uh, all their little areas and stuff like that. And they also had really good beer at the end. Oh, yeah. We sampled some of that this past summer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, Island yeah. People, yeah, the Goose Island people gave us, gave us the beer on that one. That was very nice, very nice. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. In fact, we went, we ran right by. Um, uh, if you ask, if you ask Mr. Basil about this, he he was there. We ran right by uh, McCormick Place, which is where we were spending mm. most of the time. So, yeah, we kind of went there, but it was such a big place we got lost and ended up with the kitchen staff. We Ooh. couldn't find our way out of there. It oh, that's a shame. Yeah, we just met Basil back at the hotel later. Oh, okay. It was, was three he, days he, that we were stuck. Was he conscious? <laughs> was he all right? <laughs> oh, well, he didn't really notice. He was partying too much. Hmm. I see. I see. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that seems to be about right. <laughs> okay, so here's a philosophical question for you. Mm. One that I like to ask that may get down to the deep heart and soul of Mr. Patrick G. Lawler. Oh, dear. All right. The question is, if... You were a mixed drink, what would you be? Or any kind of drink. If I were a mixed drink, well, I think I would probably be an old-fashioned. Not one of those brandy old-fashioned. It would be a bourbon old-fashioned with a really good bourbon. Because I've got a, a, a bit of a kick to me, but um, overall I'm a little bit too sweet. You're so. just the Mr. Laid-back, big leather chair, kind of snuggling with the wife kind of guy then. Pretty much, pretty much. Me and, me and the wife and the dogs, that's about it. Well, that sounds like a wonderful thing. And, uh, yeah, I would like to be like that, but so far, all the women I've met are just tall enough that they get the wrong impression when I hug them. <laughs> so well, it, 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 it could take them by surprise. Oh. I was going to sneak up from behind on them, but that does, that's not much better, is it? No, no, no. And depending on what they ate, it might be <laughs> really hazardous. This is a good point. I, had, I hadn't fully thought it through. Hence the no beard. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you get burned. <laughs> okay, Bertold, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Well, I think that answers my question. And now I have a hankering for an old-fashioned. I think I'll head out and wait for my brother's. Me too. That sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Berthold. Okay, Mr. Basil, we'll see you later. And thank you very much, Patrick, for joining us for the show. It's Absolutely. been a terrific chat. And yeah. uh, looking forward to seeing you again at uh, perhaps the next APAC or who knows, something in between there or other time. Or, or if for some reason I land in Milwaukee, I'll give you a call and we'll meet up. Oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, it was fun. A, I love doing these. It's, it's great. And this was, it was kind of like after, you know, that's like, it's just kind of talking, you know, so yeah. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too bad. 
Absolutely. It's I used to I used to do talk radio and uh -huh. uh, I had a conservative political comedy show, kind of like a conservative John Stewart kind of thing. Oh, okay. Did on just on local radio here, and uh, that was one of the things I just loved to do was just get the guests in. Yeah, we'll talk about the important topics for a little bit, and then we're just going to chat for oh, yeah. the next 30 or 40 minutes and, and take calls, and it was fun. This one, at least I don't have to worry about taking calls and having exactly. people assault my guests. <laughs> the, so. first, the, the first one I ever did, uh, the first radio interview I ever did, they had just found a book called um, – or not a book, a, a record. Um, I can't remember what it was called, but – it was all these famous people singing these ridiculous songs, like um, it was Bill Shatner doing uh, um, like a rolling or Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. <laughs> and um, uh, Sebastian Cabot was doing like a Rolling Stone. And uh, um, uh, Lauren Green had the legend of Johnny Ringo. And, <laughs> and there were there were all these Leonard Nimoy had something. There were all these different people with these just absurd songs. And so. So basically, we were supposed to be talking about the, the Shakespeare Festival we were doing, but uh, my buddy and I, who ended up becoming my comedy fight partner uh, for several years, we just basically sat in there and just, you know, the, the entire hour was just riffing off of that album. And every now and then they said, oh, we should probably talk about the Shakespeare Festival, huh? It's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's every night in center, Central Park. It's free. Come on out. <laughs> oh, there you go. We're yeah, doing whatever I, right now. So, so what about Bill Shatner? Let's get back to that. <laughs> Lucy in the sky. Oh, and he had this weird, it was like he was, it was, he had this voice that he was doing. And it was just like, it was weird, but it was, it was so much fun. But I mean, the best interviews sometimes just never get to the point. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. I remember I did an interview with a local politician one time and we, we talked for maybe five or 10 minutes and I had him on for 30 minutes. And after that first couple, after the first commercial break, it was something about some kind of c cereal sale at the local grocery store. And uh, <laughs> then we started talking about our favorite breakfast cereals from the seventies that we don't see anymore. And that turned into an hour-long people calling in and reminiscing about buckwheats and crispy something or another. Wisp, wisp and quake. Were the exactly, yeah. So yeah. lots of fun, lots of fun. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'll let you go. I know it's late at night for you. Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go have dinner now. So. Oh yeah. Oh wow, you eat late. Go go have dinner. Well, not usually. It's just it's just the way we we had a late lunch, so it was uh, kind of. Uh, so I gotta get back. I gotta get back to the Olympics too. So. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's my family's in there watching it now. Oh well, there you go. Well, go join them. I will. Thanks. Yeah. We'll see you later. All right. It was great talking to you. Keep in I, touch. Will do. And that was Patrick Lawler. What a cool guy. And he had a baron in the back. Ah, oh, I love playing the baron. Hey, let's get ours down and play some right now. Oh yeah, let's go for it. Okay, ready? You start. One, two. One, two, three, four, go! And while Basil's silly leprechaun friends enjoy their time dancing a jig about while playing the barren, I would like to talk to you today about soap. Gerald, would you like to talk to us about soap? Join in with me. Ah, uh, I don't know a whole lot oh, about yeah, soap, good, actually. That is why we should talk about it. Gerald has never taken a bath. I, I have too taken a bath. How do you think I got that moss out from under my armpit? Ah, uh, yes, indeed. I see. I think you are an irritating little man. And I am going to go play my bowren with the boys. Well, I hope they can stand being in the same room with you. I don't even know who you are. I think it's time for you to leave, little man. Oh, hey, what are you doing? Ah! I all want to join with you now.
Oh, yeah, that was nice. Whew. Okay, I'm ready for a bit of ale. Who's coming? Oh, yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming too. Oh, uh, I'm right behind you. Copyright 2016, Sam M. Production Studios of Alaska.